Okay, can I have everybody's attention? I understand it's a little bit more chocolate cake out there, so if you didn't get it, don't get that piece. <laughs> That's, it's a good chocolate cake. <laughs> From a skinny guy over here, he said low fat. Okay, everybody, let me, uh, before we hear our guest speaker, let me tell you a little bit about some of the upcoming events for the CEO Club. I was telling you about the Presidential Advisory Council that we have, and we meet eight times a year. The next meeting is May 14th. If you're interested in that, that's next Tuesday, I believe. See me after the meeting. Uh, we'll get you lined up. The second thing is the uh, movie, the Steve Jobs movie. How many people have read the Steve Jobs book? Not too much. It's a great, great book. I mean, if you haven't read the book, I strongly recommend it. Uh, the first part, you know, you'll be laughing at some of the things that Jobs did. I mean, he just literally was probably the worst manager in the history of America. And by the second half of the book, you'll, he'll have you crying. I mean, it's tremendous, tremendous comeback. And we all know, you know, the story of what he did. One of our members, the New York chapter, has produced a movie, the Steve Jobs movie. And it's in final production now. You heard me talk a couple meetings ago. There's going to be a premiere in New York. And there's going to be a premiere in Los Angeles. And as soon as we have a date, all the CEO Club members and their spouses are invited up to the premiere. Uh, Ashton Kushner, is that how you say his last name, is the star. Uh, so we'll be meeting backstage with him and the, and, the, and the cast and so forth. So I'll keep you posted on that. It's uh, see a show of hands. How many people would want to go to that if we decide that, that date ever comes around? Yeah, it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. I'll keep you posted. I just talked to the New York office on Monday. They still don't have a date. There's some technical things with distribution. This guy is not a movie guy. He's a business guy that put in a lot of millions of dollars. And I think some of the nuances of now with getting the distribution is coming out. So we don't have a date yet, but again, Ashton Kushner was the, the star. Anybody see any tidbits of that on CBS or ABC? They showed a little bit of it. Well, the PR guy would see that, Dan. Really looks good. And he really actually looks like Jobs, you know, in the movie. They made him really look him. So I'll keep you posted on that. The other thing is the Kristen Rita Strauss uh, Yellow Dress Golf Tournament Dinner and Auction. This is our 12th annual event. It'll be June 10th back at Hayfields Country Club. Uh, we have a few foursomes left if you're interested in that. Uh, I can't thank enough a lot of people in this room for the tremendous support. John Shakur, where's John? He's out of the room. He's been our, one of our presenting sponsors for years. John Kenny's been there from day one. A lot of the guys in this room, Troy Brewer, corporate sponsors, Marty Schwartz. I mean, I, I can't thank you enough. Like I said, we've raised over $1.1 million. Uh, the foundation is for mental health awareness and for the prevention of uh, teenage suicide. A lot of you know I lost my daughter 12 years ago to teenage suicide. And our goal now is to really... Uh, you know, help prevent this. We, one of the programs we support, with all your help through Hopkins, is the uh, Adolescent Depression Awareness Program, where we have trained over 25 kids, 25,000 kids in eight states on the warning signs of depression. Because kids will talk to other kids before they talk to adults. And um, we, our goal is to take that program national. Like I said, we're in eight states now, and it's. Uh, it's really very successful. Hopkins has done a great job. And like I said, John's been one of our great supporters, and we certainly appreciate that. So if you're interested in that, it's a lot of fun. It's a great day of golf at Hayfields. We have the dinner and the auction. John Levinson's our auctioneer. And raffle tickets, the last person won $15,000, I think, too, in the, in the raffle. So see me or Sharon after the meeting if you want to get involved. The following CEO Club meeting is June 20th with Jim Bouchard, who's a national news commentator. He's also a black belt in karate, and his, his whole topic is think like a black belt. He takes the concept of, you know, that competitive nature from that arena into the world of business. The following meeting after that is September 26th. And then mark on your calendar, October 26th, we're having a Halloween party back at my house. How many people came to the last one at my house? Anybody? Nobody here? Okay, well, get your costume early. Oh, we got a couple hands here. <laughs> Got a lot of time to get your costumes. Like October 26th, the vote was to have it before Halloween, even though the Saturday after, I guess, was November 2nd. So that's on the schedule. Okay, there's a little bit of the upcoming events. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest speaker. I had the pleasure to talk a little bit with Dan at lunchtime. I mean, really interesting guy. He began his major league career in 1981 with the Milwaukee Brewers, working in the scouting department, and eventually as their lead scouting coordinator. 
and in 87 he joined the Montreal Expos as their director of player development and again moved all the way up the ladder, this time to vice president and general manager. During that time with the Expos, he was named the Sporting News Executive of the Year, which is a great, great honor in baseball, I can assure you. And despite having one of the lowest payrolls in the league, he led the Expos to the best winning percentage record in baseball from 1992 to 1994. Then in 1994, he joined the Boston Red Sox as the Executive Vice President and General Manager. And during his tenure, the club made the playoffs three times. And for the first time in Boston in 80 years, in 1998 and 1999, they made back-to-back -back playoffs. First time in 80 years. I'm sure he was a hero there. The Boston Red Sox won the World Series in 2004. I remember where I was when they won that series in, in Phoenix. And seven of the players on that team were acquired by Dan. He's been a veteran of over two decades in Major League Baseball with his proven skills and success of scouting, recruiting, and developing players. In November of 2011, the Orioles named Dan Duquette their new executive vice president of baseball operations. And then it all began in 2012, last year. The Orioles made a 24-game improvement, almost unheard of in sports and baseball from the previous year and won the American League wild card. And I'm sure everybody in the room know we came within a whisker of beating the Yankees. We should have beat the Yankees. And we're going to do it again this year. Numerous players acquired by Dan played key roles in the club's most successful season in years. And you heard it from the horse's mouth. You heard it from Lou. One of the best years in the last 20 years he's been involved. All of baseball is counting on Dan, and all of baseball here in Baltimore. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want to put too much weight on your shoulders. All the people here in Baltimore counting on him to bring the orange back to our town along with the spirit, as well as the enthusiasm that seems to be the Orioles again. And as the famous late broadcaster Chuck Thompson would say, ain't the beer cold. Dan Duquette, everybody. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. And uh, I want to thank Luke Casoris for inviting me here today. I, you know, Frank uh, Kalarik and I go way back. And when I was scouting director with the Brewers and Frank was uh, a scout for us, I used to say, Frank, don't be afraid to go see a player for the Brewers instead of recommending all those guys for Johnny's. <laughs> now we're glad to have Frank back. And he's still recruiting for Yaus's Orioles here in town with Dean Albany. But I got to tell you, Frank's kid is a great left-handed pitcher with the Mets. He throws a lot like our Brian Mattis, who came in last night and got a key out for us. And uh, I'll tell you, one of Frank's claim to fame is that he was a catcher and he played against Buck Showalter, our manager there in the Eastern League. Frank played for West, West Haven? Waterbury. Waterbury. And uh, Buck was playing for the West, West Haven Yankees. So anyway... Um, I want to tell you a quick story. I, we have a five-year-old son named Brody, <clears throat> and Brody was with us in spring training. And he sat down with the scouts one day, and Brian Cashman, the general manager of the Yankees, tried to give Brody a Yankee hat. <laughs> and Brody said, no, thanks a lot. That's okay, Brian. Um, I, I'll stick with my Oriole hat. He said, no, come on, Brody. He said, I'll, I'll give you an authentic Yankee hat. He said, could you just put it on for me? He goes, no, I don't think my dad would like that very much. <laughs> so I said, okay, thank you very much, Brody. So Brody signed up for T-ball in Pasadena at the Little League. And guess what team he's on? <laughs> he's on the Yankees. So Brody brings his uh, Yankee hat home, and he brings his Yankee jersey home. And he goes, Dan, is it okay if I wear this? <laughs> I said, Brody, I'll root for you. But let me tell you, I have never rooted one day for the effing Yankees. <clears throat> and and I, I, will root you, I will root for you and support you, but I'm not going to root for that team, buddy. <clears throat> so Brody comes home the other day. I said, Brody, how'd you do? He said, oh, Dan, I hit a rocket shot out of the infield. I said, yeah? He said, yeah. He said, I got it out of the infield. I said, when's your next game? He goes, it's Friday. 
He said, but I'm not going. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, the coach said it was a makeup game. And I said, there's no way I'm wearing makeup to go to that ball game. <laughs> I said, good for you, Brody. <laughs> good for you. So anyway, the, uh, the Orioles turnaround was really uh, started when uh, Andy McPhail made a great trade and he picked up Adam Jones and, and uh, Chris Tillman and started a foundation and then it was uh, further moved along when the club drafted uh, Matt Wieters. And then <clears throat> the club brought in uh, Buck Showalter, who's a turnaround specialist, did some great things with the Rangers and really did a fantastic job with Arizona. Uh, what Buck did the second year in Arizona, uh, he improved that team. It was an expansion team and he was there to build the club. The second year I think they improved like 33 games. And so uh, when I came on board, we had a good ball club. We had uh, Weeders at catcher, we had Hardy at shortstop, we had Jones in center field, uh, we had Nick Markakis. So, so we had the foundation of a pretty good ball club, but we had lousy pitching. Uh, we were like 14th in the league, and our starting pitching was the worst. So when I got trained by Harry Dalton in Milwaukee, he always told me, you know, it's all about defense, and the first line of defense is right there on the mound. And it's about pitching, it's about pitching, it's about pitching, it's about pitching. And my job was really to go out and find some decent pitching to staff the club so that we had an opportunity to play games and be competitive. And if, so, so you fast forward a year, uh, we helped the guys uh, by signing some starting pitching. We had a decent bullpen, which means our starters don't have to go as long, right? And this year, uh, you know, we, we have the foundation of that team back. We have the great privilege of having uh, Nate McClough on the team to start the season. He's a terrific, terrific leadoff guy and very good defender. And the, the, third, the kid third baseman, Machado, I don't know where you find players like him, but he, he's, just, he's just fantastic. I mean, there's a guy that can entertain you every night when you come out to the ballpark. He makes terrific plays, and he's the best clutch hitter in the business since he came up. Now think about that, okay? Think about that for a second. Since Manny Machado came up with runners in scoring position, he's the best hitter in the business. He's the best RBI guy in the whole league. He's better than Cabrera with runners in scoring position. And, and not only that, he's, he's just a fantastic uh, third baseman. So uh, Earl Weaver, God rest his soul, was around the ball club last year. And Earl come to spring training. And Earl said, Dan, he said, you need to listen to me in spring training. I said, oh, don't worry, Earl, I'm going to listen to you. Uh, uh, you know, Harry introduced me to Earl when Earl was managing the... Uh, the Orioles, and we used to go up in the dining room at County Stadium, and we'd have Earl and George Bamberger and Herman Starrett, Andy Echebarren, and Harry. They had all worked and come up in the Oriole organization. Of course, they'd have a, a beer afterward. And we, we played against the Orioles in the pennant in, I think, 1981. In 1982, it went down to the last game uh, right here in Baltimore. But anyway, um, I always listened to Earl, and, and Earl was terrific to me because Harry had hired me and, and Harry had given Earl his uh, first job and, and so I said, of course I'm going to listen to you, Earl. He said, well, you better listen to me. He said, because last year I told Buck that J.J. Hardy was going to have a great year. And Earl says to me, he said, how did he do? I said, well, he hit 30 home runs, Earl. He said, well, you need to listen to me this year. He said, because I'm picking Chris Davis. I said, all right. So Chris Davis comes up with 33 home runs. So Earl came to all the statue unveilings last year. And I said, Earl, I said, uh, I want to know before spring training, who are you picking for next year? He said, oh, that's an easy one. It's your third baseman, Manny Machado. <laughs> so people wanted to uh, know why we would bring up Machado and, and uh, play him at third base. Well, we were just following Earl's. Uh, mantra, which was sign all the shortstops you can and then we'll worry about where we're going to play them once they get to the big leagues. <laughs> pretty, pretty good, worked pretty good, worked pretty good for Earl and uh, sounded pretty good to us. So we knew that Manny Machado could play spring training, could play shortstop because we saw him in spring training and 
when it came time to solidify the interior defense last year, we, we, we brought him up, and of course he's done a great job at third base. Um, the, you know, the, um, the, the other thing that the Orioles uh, have done is that we, we've got great leadership on our ball club. Uh, Matt Weeders, the catcher, is in on just about every play. He's, he's the emissary of the manager, really, during the game the catcher is. He and Buck have a great relationship. They go over how to get the hitters out every day. And, of course, Matt's there. Caught more innings than any catcher in the American League the last couple of years. We got Hardy at shortstop, terrific leader. Actually played more innings and caught more ground balls than any infielder in the league last year. Adam Jones, center field, played more innings, got to more balls in the outfield than any outfielder in the American League last year. So you got three gold glovers up the middle. You got excellent management. And then on the tail end, we've got Jimmy Johnson, who's had 50 saves last year, virtually unheard of in the business. And he's back again doing the same thing this year. So the ball club is strong up the middle. Uh, we have good depth in the, in the uh, minor league system. We got some uh, good depth at AAA. Uh, we got another young infield at AAA named John Scope that could come up and help us during the season. Uh, we've continued to uh, add to the pitching staff wherever we can. Uh, we picked up a kid, McFarlane, in the draft who's going to be a good pitcher. He's pitching out of the bullpen, but we think he's going to be a good starter. You know, Hamill's solid, Chen is solid. Uh, Freddie Garcia had a great debut the other day. Um, he looks good in an Oriole uniform. I've seen him in several other uniforms, but I've got to tell you, I like him in that Oriole uniform. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we should be in this thing. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, 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 the lineup, you know, last year we had the second most home runs of any ball club in the big leagues. The Yankees were first. And what we were lacking was we had more solo home runs than we had two and three run homers. So our plan this year was to help those young hitters have a better perspective on the pitches that they like to hit. So we've encouraged them to be patient and to look for uh, pitches they can hit rather than the pitcher's pitches. So as Eddie Murray would say, we want to have some passengers on base when them balls take flight. <laughs> so now if you take a look at it, McLeod is good on base. Uh, Machado is good on base. Machado is a terrific number two hitter. He lets McLeod steal on the first pitch because he's got the patience and the confidence to hit later in the count. Marcakis is good at getting on base. And then we have a legit four, five, and six in, in uh, Davis and uh, Matt Wieters and Adam Jones. So the formula is really goes back to Earl. It's pretty simple. You got pitching. Every player that we've brought up has been good defensively, right? The, the, the kid, um, uh, McLeod is good defensively. Machado is good defensively. Flaherty hasn't been able to hit very much, but he's very good defensively. Uh, Chris Davis is good defensively, and he's getting better at first base. And then you have the three gold glovers up the middle, so we got solid pitching, good defense, and now we got guys on base, so we get three run homers, right? So it, it, it just comes back to uh, Earl Weaver. So it's it's not a complicated uh, it's not a complicated philosophy. You know, it is complicated to get all the guys there at the same time. Uh, at the same times of their careers when they're doing real well. And fortunately, we have that group here, and we have uh, excellent leadership in Buck. And, and I, I got to tell you, the, um, the Angelos family wants nothing more but to have a good team uh, for the city of Baltimore, and our aim is to give you a good contending team year in and year out. If we make good investments in our scouting and player development operation, which we are doing, uh, last year we got a kid named Kevin Gossman in the draft who's down in Bowie. You'll see him up here before the year's over. Um, we got a, a Cuban named Henry Aridia who's down in Bowie also, who's got a future with the Orioles pretty, pretty quickly. You know, his future's ahead of him, as they say. <laughs> um, so we're making good investments, and uh, we should have a good team, and we look forward to having you all come out to the ballpark. Um, we, we do have a lot of uh, suite packages. We got uh, good availability of tickets, but I don't think that's going to last forever because we're, we're planning on having a good team year in and year out for you. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is I'll take some hanging sliders or a couple questions from you <laughs> so we can talk about you know, your team and what you, know, you want to hear from me. Yes, sir. Can we talk about this one? Uh, <coughs> on, on and, uh, I can't, it was a clear, my friend. 
Uh, did the umpire miss a call? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll talk uh, a little generally about instant replay. You see instant replay come into all these other sports, and the, 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 uh, you know, the trick is to do it efficiently so that you're not really interrupting the game. And there's some great technologies out there. I know on the tennis tour, uh, they, they can tell you if the ball is electronically, if it's outside the line. So there's some great technology that baseball is looking at the, um, you know, to, to, to have the technology and then miss it, you know, I, I don't know how that, I don't know how people can do that, but occasionally that happens. But the, you know, the trick for baseball, and Bud Silly, the commissioner, is a traditionalist. He wants the game to move along. He likes the human element to the game. But this technology is really detracting a little bit from the product because everybody at home or in the ballpark, they know the guy missed it. Everybody knows that he missed it except the guy that made the call. So uh, there, there's going to be there's some initiatives. Joe Torre's working on it. Tony Larusa, former manager with the Cardinals, those guys are working on that committee. And John Sherholz, uh, Towson State boy, uh, they're charged with coming up with recommendations for baseball to implement. I don't think you'll see them implemented this year, but I think you'll see them next year. And they got some really good baseball guys on top of that. Uh, you know, the idea is to keep the game moving. You know, most of the calls that are missed, a high percentage of them are missed, are at first base, the bang bang place. They've got the instant replay for the home runs, which is the sports knockout punch, and they're getting those right invariably. You know, they missed that one last night, but they're getting those right. Uh, there was a call at our game, a ball went out of the ballpark and it hit on the back railing out by our bullpen. A buck went out and had them take a look at it. They came back in, they look at it, and they got the call right for Adam Jones. So they're getting those, the home run calls right. I'm not convinced they got McLeod's home run call in the playoffs with the Yankees right. Uh, you know, <laughs> according to the people in Yankee Stadium, they didn't get it right. Um, but uh, it, it's getting better, okay? And you'll see some initiatives. The, the technology is just awesome. That that that, uh, that they can come up with and, and, and get it right. Hey, talk about your strategy a little bit, if you can. When, when, a, when a business expert goes into a company or an organization that's having problems, is there a certain strategy or threshold they like to look at, and they have to make changes sometime very quickly? What was your strategy coming into the baseball operations that made you do whatever you did, and how quickly did you do it? Well, the the. the uh, you know, when you go into any situation, uh, you, you wouldn't get this opportunity unless, you know, there was a need, right? And, and the crisis creates an opportunity. In, in, in the baseball business, it's generally a performance issue. But again, it, w what I did was I took a look at the fundamentals of the team. I took a look at the assets of the team, stable ownership, great ballpark. We got all these minor league teams around the area which is a great opportunity. I knew from my experience in Boston that if you have a good team and you have these affiliates around you, you can really grow your audience quickly. We had the, we had the infrastructure of Masson, which is, a, which is a huge asset to the ball club to be able to grow the audience. So we have all those assets in place. We got, now we gotta have a good product, right? So my job was to come in and take a look at what we needed. And so I took a look at the club. We had good foundation up the middle. We had a good manager. Um, I didn't have any history with the pitching coach, but that, that's a key position. Rick and Darius done a great job. We had, we had Weeders who won a gold glove. We had Hardy that won a gold glove. We had Adam Jones in center field. They're all 25 years old. And I took a look at the farm system. I saw we had Machado. We had Bundy. And I said, we need some pitching. Um, you know, that's it. And then we put in a pitching program. You know, the, George Bamberg used to tell me, he said, Danny, he said, let me tell you something. He said, pitching is pretty simple. He said, but not, not that many people know it's pretty simple. Okay? And like uh, Einstein says, he said, until you can explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. So I got some good pitching people that knew pitching that could explain it to the guys that we had, and we went out and got some decent pitching. And that's really the foundation of our program. Uh, but it, it was really about assessing the assets of the business and then looking at the underlying issues for the, for the performance of the club. And like I said, we had a lot of the elements in place. Yes? Dan, there's so many analogies made between team sports and running a business. Um, what makes a good scout? How do you create um, not only someone finding someone that has a good skill set but fits the culture of your team? Because um, I think that will translate into what I'd like to hear from. 
Oh, okay, good. Well, you, I always say a good scout knows where the players are. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, right? But a good scout has to have a, an idea of the uh, evaluative skills. So Frank and I, we were just talking, when Frank was a, a scout just coming on, he'd go to all the ballparks in the southeast, and, and uh, he was a Yankee down in uh, enemy territory, so the scouts didn't really sit down with him and help him up out, but he had one scout with the Dodgers that uh, he sat down with one day, and Frank said, I don't really know what I'm looking at. And the Dodger scout let him talk on for a while, and he said, well, he said, the big thing is you got to pick out the thoroughbreds from the mules. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that the truth, right? Well, we're all looking for the 20% uh, of the people that are going to do 80% of the work in our organizations, right? And, uh, you know, that's what you're looking for in your key players, your core players. So you got to know what you're looking for in terms of the talent base that you're looking for. And then really it's about leadership. To me, it's about showing them that you show up every day, that you care about them, and that you're going to give your, your passionate best for the business. That, that that's, to me, is what leadership is about. And if you do that, you'll attract people to your business that are passionate about your business, that have the same passion as you, and they'll follow your lead. Yes? Um, I know that you're a big numbers guy, so... I am? Question about gambling yeah, metrics. <laughs> When you see guys struggling to play like Brian Flair, you see like you know, batting average, on base percentage, like, kind of, all those are down. But what do you look at in between those numbers that kind of give you hope? And I guess how long do you look um, before you kind of say, you know what, maybe you have to go back down to the minor. So the question is what kind of metrics are you looking at in between those numbers? And I guess how long is a good sample size? Well, I'm, I'm a performance scout. Okay, the people say, well, you're a big numbers guy. I think the numbers help you objectively assess the performance of the player. So to the extent that the numbers help you identify their contribution and put a monetary a tag on that contribution, I think it's very helpful. Now, if you have a performance issue, the performance issues, are, they have a lot to do with personnel, right? Because these are human beings that are performing on the job. So how much time does it take? You know, it really depends on the person. How much, how much time can you give it? You have to have a certain standard that needs to be met. You have to have a certain threshold that you, has to be met throughout the organization. So in the case of, let's talk about Ryan Flaherty. What does Ryan Flaherty have? Ryan Flaherty's an outstanding defensive player. He's got good tools. He's got good hands. He's got a good arm. He's got an excellent makeup. And I'll tell you what, he has at the plate as a hitter. He's a left-handed hitter. He's got power. He's got power to hit the ball out all around the ballpark. So he, he has a couple of issues that he needs to address so that he can utilize that power. And... Um, the fact that we put a lot of stock in defense and he can still do his job on one side of the ball while he's working on the other side of the ball uh, means that he's going to get a little bit more time. He'll get enough time where he can hit. He's, he's going to start hitting in another day or so. You keep your eye on that. <laughs> yes? Yeah, it seemed like there was a point in time where the Yankees fought the best players and won all the games. It was like, well, you're watching baseball, but it's all about business and money. But to watch the Orioles, who are a young team, and not necessarily getting this kind of payroll win, and they're so excited, it makes, to me, it brings my heart back to baseball, which kind of, I've lost interest in it. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We have a young team, we have a hungry team, and they, they have really... Uh, adopted the city. They have a terrific work ethic. Look at all those one-run games we had last year. Look at all the extra inning games we had last year. These guys show up for the ballpark and they're there to get the job done. So Sunday afternoon against California, right, we got behind three to one. Okay, and I said to Buck on Monday, I said, Buck, I was so glad we won that last game on uh, Sunday. It really made the road trip. He goes, well, about the third inning, I said to him, I said, boys, the bus is leaving at 5 o'clock, okay, whether we win or lose. So if we're going to be here to play, we might as well play to win and kick their ass. <laughs> so right, if we're going to spend our time together, we might as well make the most of it. And what did they do? They went out and they, they made some pitches, Hamill right of the ship. Uh, we ended up getting a home run from Machado, and then our, our bullpen handled the game. But, but this club... I am so proud of the way this club plays. I mean, they play with passion. They, they, you know, they play with intensity, and they are there to win the game. This is a hungry ball club, and uh, you know, I, I'm so proud of the way these guys go about their business. In the last 
last 20 or 25 years that you've been a part of this, the game has changed pretty dramatically, um, particularly with regard to carrying all the specialist type pictures. We have Jim Palmer does the color commentation for the game, and I remember growing up as a kid seeing him go nine innings many times in that pitching staff in the 70s. And now it seems like nobody does that anymore. It's almost an automatic, you have to put your closer in in the ninth inning, regardless of the left-handed versus right-handed situation. I'm just curious if you could comment on to what drove a change like that and, and how you adapt to it or, or, or take part in shaping it. Well, i got to tell you, if we could have a pitching staff of Jim Palmer's, we'd be doing pretty good. Okay? But there's only been one Jim Palmer in the history of the Orioles, and he's ended up being the best starting pitcher in the, in the history of the team, and he's a Hall of Famer. Okay? So we are looking for pitchers like Jim Palmer. i got to tell you, when I look at a relief pitcher and i got to go out and get a, 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 a lefty specialist, it's like I can't stand to go get a lefty specialist. Because now i got to get a righty as soon as the right-hander comes in. And the manager's got to go out and take out the lefty specialist. He's got to bring in another pitcher to get out the guy behind him. So when I look for relief pitchers, I look for guys that can get out righties and lefties. Now, some guys are better at it than others. Okay? And um, I, the industry does not do a great job in terms of processing pitchers and keeping pitchers healthy. You know, to me, the number one criteria in judging a pitching coach was do they keep their pitchers healthy over the course of the year. You see a lot of these teams that win the pennant, they, they know how to manage the pitchers and get them through the season and, and have them throw the ball efficiently. Uh, so we can do a better job with that, and we're, we're, we are working towards that. Uh, but, you know, our, our current group, these guys, they have a good idea in terms of, if you take a look at the numbers, a lot of these guys, they can't get anybody out after 100 pitches, okay, because they, they, they just can't do it. And if you take a look at the numbers, the more times the hitter faces the same pitcher in the game, the bigger advantage the hitter has. So that's why you see the, the manager go to the bullpen, because the odds are in his favor with the guy that he brings in. He's got a better chance to get the guy out than the guy he has on the mound. So you see a lot of that based on the matchups and, and the leverage to have the advantage. And the good managers like Buck, they know how to use their pitchers late in the game to hold the lead. Yes, sir? Speaking of pitching, what do you think of the knuckleball pitcher? Well, I, I'm partial to the knuckleball. Um, I was at the uh, New York Baseball Writers Dinner this year and Phil Necro was there to give out the Cy Young Award to R.A. Dickey. And Phil Necro and I worked together in Boston. I brought him in as a consultant to work with Tim Wakefield after we picked up Tim Wakefield when he got released from the, from the Pirates. And we sat in Fort Myers, Florida and Phil Necro said to Tim Wakefield, he said, Timmy, if you learn how to control the knuckleball, you can pitch till you're 45 years old. Okay, that was when he was 28. So 17 years later, Tim Wakefield got more outs than any pitcher in the history of the Red Sox. He got 200 wins. So I'm partial to the knuckleball because I understand the value of the knuckleball. So we hired Phil Necro, and he come to spring training, and he identified a couple guys in our minor league system that he's working with. One is Eddie Gamboa who's down in Bowie, and he just recruited Zach Clark, who we took off the roster. He's going to be working with Necro starting today. He's down in Bowie today. So I, I, I'm all for the knuckleball. Actually, Buck is the one that recommended R.A. Dickey be a knuckler. He had him in Texas. So, uh, you know, we're, we're for it. We understand the value of it in terms of the innings for the, for the uh, pitchers, in terms of the innings for the staff and having stability to your staff. So you'll see a couple of knuckleballers coming through here. Yes? I was wondering if you could just give us a little perspective on um, negotiations with some of these higher paid players. This gentleman had mentioned the fact that you, know, you have some major superstars out there. And I know it really hasn't applied recently in Baltimore. When you take a look at a guy like Albert Pujols, you take a look at um, Josh Hamilton, and they have such great careers, probably more specifically Pujols, who could have been the king of St. Louis. And, had a statue up there with Bob Gibson and those folks. Is it just the money that makes these guys need to go to these other cities? What other factors do you play? None. <laughs> 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 As soon as they start saying it's not about the money, guess what? <laughs> they have short careers, right? 
I mean, their, their, their careers are short, so they, they, they need to go where the money is. That's, that's the way the system's set up. But my idea is to have a good farm system so you have good players coming to your team and, uh, you know, you can have them there, you know, for the best years of the career. You're not going to have them there for the whole time because you couldn't afford them all. But, you know, you, sh you should be able to have a good competitive team. But you see all these uh, teams signing the mega contracts. They're teams with huge uh, media assets. So you see the Dodgers, they signed uh, Greinke. Right, they, he got a huge deal in the off season, and then the Angels they signed Pujols the year before, and then they signed Josh Hamilton, who uh, a year ago yesterday actually had four home runs and a double against us. Um, but I mean, you know, they, the, the, the players go where the money is, and the, and the money is right now being driven by the media revenues in these in these uh, major markets. But we, I tell you what. We can feel the competitive team. I, I don't really talk about payroll because it doesn't really do us any good. You know, our job is to feel the competitive team. We have a competitive hustling team, and we should be able to sustain that. Yes? So, uh, great job so far, Dan. Thank you. Uh, kind of segue into the money situation. What's the uh, progress on uh, nego negotiations with Matt Peters? Uh, we don't have any negotiations going on, and we don't do that during the season. So, we got Matt. I think he's a uh, three-plus player, so we have him with us for this year, next year, the year after. Yes. Um, stay out of my talk a little bit. Where, uh, what is the status of revenue sharing? The owners essentially said this is where we're going to be. Or do you ever see people agitating more of a style of revenue sharing, or some uh, modification to the taxes? Well, the the, um, the question is, uh, you know, what, what, what about the revenue sharing at the uh, at the league level? The the league just negotiated a new basic agreement a year ago with the players, which has um, some provisions for competitive balance. There's a competitive balance tax, which is another form of revenue sharing. So the high market clubs they have to pay a tax to the other ball clubs that's filtered down through the industry. Now, the uh, Major League Baseball, they share a lot of the uh, national media revenues and the international media revenues that come from uh, MLB.com or Major League Baseball Advanced Media. So there's progress in, on those regard. But the local media revenues are not shared uh, from club to club, and the competitive balance tax is in place to address that. So uh, Pete Rozelle, years ago, use the national TV contracts to even the playing field for all the clubs and they did a terrific job with the NFL and uh, Bud Selig is growing the game internationally in an effort to more evenly distribute the media revenues to all the clubs and uh, there's ma they're, ma they're making progress on that but the major media markets still have a significant uh, competitive advantage because of the local media revenues. Yes. Dan, you mentioned a couple of times how hungry the players are. Um, I, my question is, what is Buck and the rest of your staff doing to create, foster, and fan a sense of hunger and, and really make it work for the team? Well, you know, um, the, uh, the, the players really enjoy playing for Buck because Buck's a champion for the players. He supports them, but he also helps them prepare for their job to perform. And if you help them prepare for their job properly and they do perform, what happens? They make a lot of money. So there's a, uh, there's a very good atmosphere in the clubhouse. Uh, Buck is a real solid, dependable baseball man. Got excellent leadership and, and good coaches, and we have terrific facilities. We got a great facility down in uh, Sarasota, uh, which the Angelos family did a terrific job. I mean, we we have a facility that's the envy of baseball down there. If you haven't been down there, it's really top notch. And uh, so we got great training facilities uh, all through the organization. It's first class travel, and you know the, the the players know that this is a great opportunity that they have. So I, I think that. Um, you know, with Buck's leadership, they like playing for him, and um, he provides a lot of leadership to help them with their job. And he, he, you know, he does a great job putting them in positions where they can succeed. Uh, Dan, two two questions. Uh, one is you talked about earlier with um, uh, 
mechanics issue with one of the players, but you, you guys have gotten a reputation for pulling players that maybe were high draft choices, former high draft choices who, who now have you know, kind of reclaimed their career, McLeod and Steve Pierce, the guy who pitched against us last week, uh, who played good pitch last year, and then you guys signed a player today, I understand, is you know, kind of a former high draft choice player who's struggling to play. Is, do you draft those guys like seeing something mechanically that you say, I think we can fix this, and, and then it's a matter of fixing it, or are you drafting people who you're just hoping to change the scenery helps, or is there a formula there, or is it just kind of... Well, we, we have some good scouts. I have some really good veteran scouts. Uh, Fred Ferreira picked up Miguel Gonzalez last year. He saw him in the Mexican League, and he was coming back from, excuse me, Tommy John surgery. Lee Thomas, the former general manager with the Cardinals, or I'm sorry, with the Phillies, uh, he recommended Nate McLeod to us last year. We tried to sign him. Pittsburgh got him. And then when he got released, Lee said, you know, we really ought to take a crack at this guy. He was a good player in the National League. So, you know, we try to look for uh, what the player does well, what the player's strength is, you know, what they bring to the team and how they could help the team. And then we try to identify that with their performance, uh, as well as the scouting and the video assets. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm really a, uh, you know, if you're going to win, you've got to have players better than the other team. So it's like I don't mess around with the midline player. I'm, I'm always looking for the player that can be better than the average player. And our scouts are too. And, you know, that's, you know if you keep your standards up, you've you got a much better chance to get what you're looking for. So I think that's probably the best way to build a team. You know, be aggressive in scouting. You know, look for value in all the different markets, and then uh, do what you can to help them in terms of de developing their skills. I think that's really the uh, that's really the formula for us. How long before we see Steve Johnson? Uh, well, pretty soon. <laughs> you might see him sooner than you think. Yes. The Orioles. And what is their involvement in, in Little League Baseball in town? And I mean, you see in this area, lacrosse has become a huge sport. Um, I grew up playing baseball here, and, and what you see a lot of great athletes now playing lacrosse. Is anyone else involved at all in, in trying to develop more baseball players locally and just developing Little League Baseball around here? The, uh, we, we spent a lot of time and resources on recruiting local players. Uh, Steve Johnson is, is a good example. Uh, we got him from the uh, Dodgers in a trade. Uh, we, we've got a, a kid, um, Josh Hader, left-handed pitcher from Old Mill, who's a good prospect that Dean Albany signed. Dean Albany is Mr. Oriole around the uh, area. And then we got a kid from Northeast High School in Pasadena, uh, a right-handed hitter that's playing in, in Frederick. So we do a lot in terms of local recruiting, making sure that we um, – have reports in on the guys that are locally, and, and we'll, we'll sign a bunch of them. And then uh, Adam Jones works in the inner city. Uh, the Orioles support the RBI program. We do clinics around the city. We're also um, active in terms of helping with facilities. Uh, and really, I think the best thing we do is that we're on TV. We're on Masson, and, and the kids can see our guys as, uh, as role models. Uh, we are losing the battle uh, to a lot of the... Um, uh, inner city athletes, they're taking up lacrosse in, in, in Florida, they take up football and basketball. Uh, but we're, we're doing a good job in terms of internationally, and MLB has an initiative for recruiting in the cities that, uh, that we're a part of. Um, but anyway, I'll let you guys get back to um, your, your work. I'll take two more questions. Uh, just in terms of changes in baseball, it seems to me you don't see switch hitters much anymore. Is there a reason for that? Well, let's see. We got uh, Weeder's a switch hitter, right? Um, Tashera is a switch hitter. He's a local guy. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think the numbers support that uh, perception. I think there's more switch hitters now than there were years ago. Uh, teams are encouraging it, and we certainly encourage it. We got a kid in the Dominican that we just signed that I think is going to be a good switch hitter. Uh, a kid named Franco. Uh, but we, we encourage it, and um, that's a big advantage to a team. You know, if you get, like if you got a switch hit and catcher like Weeders, it's got power. That's a big advantage. 
All right, last question. Yes, sir. I just want to thank you because all my in-laws are Red Sox and Yankees fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a familial affliction. Believe me, believe me, I'm familiar with it. All right, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it, and you've been a great audience. Thank you. See you all next meeting. Thank you, folks.